and welcome everyone again, now that I've hit record, <laughs> to Clay and Conversations at the Clay Studio. So Figuring Space is um, supported by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Ruth Foundation for the Arts, as, as well as our um, Clay Studio Exhibition Fund. The exhibition presents full-scale figurative sculpture um, in clay by the top artists working in the United States, Dr. Kelly Morgan, professor of the practice at Tufts University, added her integral knowledge of the history, historical use of the figure in American art over the last 200 years to deepen our usual focus on contemporary ceramic art. So I just wanna give a shout out to Kelly, who's an amazing um, scholar and curator and a wonderful co-curator and partner. The group of powerful full-scale representations of human figures serve as a body of evidence to lay bare the issues that permeate American art and social culture. Each of the artists chosen uses the figure to usurp the sometimes painful history of bodies on display in American art. They assert their autonomy and subjectivity by presenting cultural critiques through lenses of their own choosing, race, gender, class, and anti-war ideas, as well as others. And the other participating artists are Roberto Lugo, Kensuke Yamada, Christina Cordova, Chris Rogers, Sergey Isipov, Christina West, Tip Toland, George Rodriguez, um, Roxanne Swensel, and Ken Ming Park, who uh, most of whom we'll be talking to over the next couple of months on future Clay and Conversations. We also want to recognize that the Clay Studio stands on the indigenous territory known as Lenape Hawking the traditional homeland of the Leni Lenape people. We would like to take a moment to reflect on the role of the Lenape as the past, present, and future stewards of the land and the role of all of us to join in their tradition of respect and caring for the land and each other. And I'm just gonna keep talking, but eventually I will let these two amazing artists talk. First, I'll introduce you to Victoria Walton, who is an emerging visual artist based in Baltimore. She's a 2023 ceramics MFA candidate at the Un um, New York, what does NYSCC? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Alfred University and has a BFA with a focus in ceramics from Towson University. Victoria explores the wonder and complexity of black identity, creating sculpture and life-size figurative works that center the narratives of women and gender expansive people. Walton draws from her own life reflecting on the intersection of her identities, ongoing battle with her health and background of medical and emotional trauma. She further investigates the impact that historical societal factors and personal experiences have on the individual and the black community. Her work illustrates the conditions that reveal how our environment builds and breaks us down simultaneously, making multi-layered connections between clay and the body. In her practice, she creates space for subversion, emotional untethering, community, and contemplation. Jonathan Christensen Caballero is a multidisciplinary artist born and raised in Utah. He earned his AS in art from Snow College, BFA in ceramics and sculpture from Utah State University, and MFA in ceramics from Indiana University at Bloomington. He has exhibited nationally in shows such as the Regional at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati and the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art and Sika Annual Social Recession at the Western Art Gallery, Small and Mighty at the Red Lodge Clay Center. In August 2022, Christensen Caballero became the ceramic artist in residence at the Interdisciplinary Ceramic Research Center at the University of Kansas. Christensen Caballero's work focuses on the human figure and advocates for the Latin American labor community. And as Jonathan mentioned, he's also the co-curator of the show that just opened at the Fosdick Nelson Gallery at Alfred. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so um, much. I'm going to start by asking the question that I have asked to um, many artists, which is, how and why did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? I think I'll start with Victoria, if that's okay. I have always been an artist. Um, I was making clothes for a large portion of my life. That was what my first degree was in. Uh, so I've always been creative, but that was my first outlet. Um, but the figure has been primary to me. I dabbled in uh, 
oil painting. So art has just been in my blood and regardless of whether it was going to be ceramics or something else, I think um, I was always going to pursue being an artist. But it wasn't until a few years ago that I um, came into contact with clay and it changed everything. And so it's just been a wonderful journey. But um, in the last few years, I've realized that time is precious. And so there's been a particular intention on my part to just go for it, to be brave, to, to take chances and to go for exactly what I want, which is to make life-size figurative work in other sculpture um, and, and to, to make this my full time. So I'm, I'm on this journey and I'm excited to do it. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you said the word brave because it's, it's very particular to use that word because you do have to kind of wake up and every day and think about this thing. And it's not an, it's not an easy life, but it's a rewarding one. Um, I want to go back to your comment that you made clothes, made clothing. And also that now you've chosen the figure. Do you think that that's related that you sort of have been I thinking apologize about? for the light. I'm so sorry. Is that it's, it's very dramatic. It's fine. <laughs> Um, um, can yeah, you repeat the end of that question for me? Sure. Um, so you said that early on you were always making clothes and that clothes were important to your practice and that now you're working on the figure. So you do, do you see any, um, you know, is that a through line because you're have been thinking about the body for this whole time? And is that kind of why you made that transition? Um, the transition was completely organic and I had no idea that it was going to happen and the, um, when it did, but if it wasn't for me making clothes and literally working with models and measurements in the form, I don't think I would have been able to make such a drastic, um, transition into working to, to slab building, um, with the figure. I feel like slab building is has so many similarities to pattern making that my mind instantly was just like I got it and um because from my time of basically being introduced to ceramics and to kind of forcing myself into larger scale was a very short amount of time so I'm grateful for my experience with sewing because it was it really helped me to just take that leap mm -hmm. um but since I've been in grad school, I've been incorporating fabric into my work again. I left sewing alone for a while and um, I wanted to reference nature and, and build an environment around the figure that wasn't ceramic. And I was like, how can I do this? And so I started thinking about textiles and I was like I think this could be something so it's been something I've been working with for the last year and a half and I'm so glad I'm it's like worlds colliding you know so it's really cool yeah that makes a lot of sense all right well I'm going to come back to this transition and when you found clay um and I'm going to go to Jonathan and ask you to answer that how and why did you make the brave decision to make your life an art and then definitely think we should talk about the fact that you're the only two artists in the show who used any kind of textiles. So mm. go back to that. It's an interesting question to think about what motivates us to have this life in art. I think, as you said before, it, it can be kind of difficult. And I think for myself, it's almost that there's a combination of like a, a, a need and an uh, almost like an obsession to make that is something that has been with me since I was a kid. And but then at the same time, you know, like making and living this life, it, you know, there is times where it's difficult and trying to figure out how to make things come together. And so then I, I think it's also like a combination of a lot of um, dedication and kind of perseverance, you know, the day in and day out of making sure that you keep making, um, even in at times when you're tired and, or you're, you know, uh, exhausted. And so I think that it's really got to come from deep within you to have just like this real basic need that almost as if that 
your own mental health and your own well-being really kind of depends upon making. And without that, then you feel in a sense kind of unfulfilled. And I, you know, work different kinds of labor jobs uh, from the service industry to um, construction trades. And during those jobs, you know, it's like, I remember also becoming kind of frustrated at those jobs when I'm doing those things, just because they were also taking such a toll on my body and making it so then I really didn't have the energy to make. And so it's like trying to find a way that you can keep creating. Um, and, you know, even using the trades that you learned, you know, whether I'll be sewing or, um, or building in wood shop, metal shop, all these things. It's like, I think that there's something within artists that you just like, there's a real need to make kind of a obsessiveness to it. Um, Sorry. That, that um, I think is integral to like having it be a life within the arts. It's just gotta be deep within you. And if you don't do it, then it's just like, you actually can feel, at least for myself, you know, like uh, um, anxious or depressed or whatever it may be. It's like, you gotta have that just in you to keep keep going at it. Cause honestly, <laughs> it is kind of hard, you know, you gotta have a, a job that, you know, you gotta be like, making and marketing and shipping and public speaking and you know all these different things all these different roles but when it comes down to it like the thing that's the most fulfilling is that time in that studio i'm glad you said that about all the other things that are involved and i think that's why i asked the question is making your life an art because it's not just about the act of making the art itself it's all the other things you have to do kind of every day and think of yourself, um, you know, we, we sort of look down upon this idea of thinking of yourself as a business person, but when you're an artist, if you want to make, make a living, you have to think of yourself that way. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's just every, every everyday life requires budgeting, you know, financial budgeting, time budgeting. It just means that you, um, are integrating that as part of your life. So you didn't you didn't do what a lot of people do, which is to kind of go back to those early days, like when you were a kid. Was there a special thing that that really pushed you or made you understand that that art was what you wanted to do every day? Absolutely. Um, you know, I was kind of saving that for the like my transition to uh, working with clay, but really it started because my um, my dad made pots when he was a teenager. And got like a Sterling Scholar um, award and went to first went to BYU for a little while before he had to drop out because he had they my parents you know have three kids me and my two older brothers and was trying to figure out a way to support himself so he just took the first full time jobs that he could get and because of that then there was pottery and then uh, one drawing that he had made when he was younger um, in the house in like a glass kind of cabinet and then just kind of like around the house. And those vessels then are what really drew me in to then like wonder what it's like to work with clay and also just make art. And so I remember in like uh, for one Christmas, I asked for like art posters, you know, I didn't know anything, but I just like, and so my parents, I remember um, got me like um, posters of like a Monet and um, an Escher and, um, and from those posters, you know, I was drawing and honestly terrible at drawing for a really long time. And, but then I was trying to draw people then in high school, also trying to paint people, photograph people. And so for me, the, the figure has been the through line between all the art I've ever made. And the thing that captures my most um, amount of attention, uh, attention to the work. And then getting to then make my first portrait then in a uh, community college that I went to then that's when it clicked for like, you know, sculpting is where it really is the um, medium of choice, just because it felt like it could, like it three-dimensional and sculpture clicked for me in a way that drawing never really did. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, we'll come back to that. So Victoria, do you want to talk about that moment when you found clay? First of all, just hearing you talk, Jonathan, I resonate with so much of what you said. Um, thank you for highlighting the labor of making and um, just also how it feeds our emotional states and just like the necessity of creating this work. Um, hold on a second, sorry. 
something popped up on my screen. Um, yeah, I, my introduction to Clay was super interesting. I, um, I had a period of my life where I was living overseas and, um, after I had gotten my associates with fashion and, um, I came back, got sick. This is this very short version. Um, and kind of because, you know, time is short, I realized, okay, I want to finish my degree. I want to at least try. Um, and I took um, a sculpture like media class and they gave me clay and I like sculpted. I was like, okay. I was just like, I remember just being like, this is completely different than any other medium I've ever worked with before. Um, I, I resonate with what Jonathan said around um, just the creating sculpture, like working in um, two-dimensional art or just even making clothing. It just was completely different. Creating an object that I can work around that I could create in the round, you know, like something that had a, a presence, a physical weight to it. It was just something that I had never really experienced before. Um, and that's why I changed my major. And I was like, this is it. Um, but it was really in one of those foundation courses when I decided to return back to school and it just was super unexpected. I never would have guessed it. Um, but that was the moment for me. And um, great. Yeah, yeah, I love I certainly hear a lot that people just, you know, they started and then were captivated by the material, which is exciting. I want people to see um, your works. So um, I think first I'm going to bring up Jonathan's slideshow and then Victoria's and then we can though they both end with the pieces that are in the show and then we can kind of talk about the resonances because I feel there's there's a lot of interesting connections between the two okay can everybody see that yeah okay um so Jonathan do you want to talk us through this and I'll just change the slide when you tell me. Sure thing. Um, so I first just want to point out um, that uh, when making work, I think it's important to kind of understand where I'm coming from and my motivations behind making the work that I do. And for me, I come from a mixed home where my dad is um, of Scandinavian descent, but uh, grew up and born and raised in Utah. And then my mom is then uh, immigrated from Panama in her early 20s. And then, you know, I have this family that then is across borders and two different cultures and languages. And that then kind of mixed then with that my parents supported us through labor jobs. My dad as a mechanic and then my mother as a elementary school cafeteria manager and worker. And so then as I was growing up, you know, they... I couldn't help but notice them coming home, them being kind of their bodies taking a lot of strain from the jobs that they were doing to provide for our family and the kind of the financial struggles that they were, you know, they weren't necessarily trying to hide, but were just evident by the kind of lifestyle that we had. And so it's important for me to like kind of sit and reflect on those things because the work that I make now is really just a reflection of kind of where I came from is where I also feel more related to. And this is an image then um, that was taken recently. I got to travel to um, back to Panama um, for Christmas and New Year. And, you know, I had been 22 years since the last time I got to go back just because um, out of financial reasons, you know, like we weren't able to really travel there. Um, and family members would come to the United States on occasion every few years. But that is like a trying to the work in so many ways for me is a way to also reconnect and re and to remember where I come from, what my roots are and um, the 
the people who I find important that maybe in some instances aren't necessarily be treating treated as well within the United States because of their the color of their skin, because of the language they speak, and the different culture they might have. And you can go ahead to the next slide. So the body of work that I'm still really making now began in graduate school and I had been working with clay um, and making figures entirely out of clay and before that also with mixed media. Um, but then this body of work that I have now is using fibers, um, secondhand clothes in a life-size format with then ceramic heads and hands and then other kinds of construction materials for the bases and found objects to then illustrate the frustration that um, I feel and with how the Latin American community is treated and sometimes perceived as not contributing to the United States, seen as um, a community that is actually taking as opposed to contributing. And in 2016, 2015, 2016, then with the um, election of 45, uh, I was kind of, there was a lot of public vitriol in politics and towards the Latin American community um, of uh, Mexican and Central American migrants and immigrants trying to really find a better life for themselves. And, but in so many ways being um, belittled publicly by politicians, um, and then that kind of combined with the fact that then the, um, all the, um, rhetoric around building the wall, as well as then, um, people being stopped and trapped really in, um, along the border when they're trying to seek a, um, asylum for all kinds of violence as well as then, and then 2019 with the shooting in El Paso where, a uh, white supremacist then uh, murdered uh, 23 people, I believe, um, because of their being Latino. And I think that a lot of this work then came from a place of like trying um, uh, my role, what is my role as the artist, um, you know, as a maker and trying to make work that then is honestly criticizing the way that Latin Americans are treated within the United States, um, despite you know, being here for as long as we have been, you know, before the United States was the United States. And so there's this use of materials and there was this connection then with the uh, Maya blue that I was learning about and researching when looking at um, ceramic sculpture murals throughout then Latin America and particularly with Maya blue then in the um, Yucatan and then Guatemala and, and Belize. Um, but then that material indigo has then in that was made to make Maya blue still then has this reflection in then the cotton and indigo used to color jeans. So it's like this one material kind of over time having this connection is what I kind of um, realized and like how people are describing themselves and visualizing themselves. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. And I made a lot of work coming from that place of frustration. Um, and trying to figure out what it means to be in the United States um, with this heritage and who, who gets to be seen and who is unseen within the United States. And, but then with the, what happened in El Paso in 2019, um, and then sitting with this amount of really pain and suffering that can, um, can be people's daily lives. I also started to think about what does it mean to, to what is the motivation to sustain these things? And more often than not, you know, it's coming from a place of trying to care and yeah. um, take care of your community and family and the people who are important to you. And so then once I started to think more about that and started to try to figure out what is my role as a maker, what kind of imagery am I creating um, that will is in, in essence creating a narrative that is stuck in a moment. Do I want to be as a maker only showing the pain and suffering of, of our community? Or can it also be a moment to actually um, reflect on the things and our strengths uh, instead? And so Hijo Mio is really thinking about 
a moment in which uh, this um, this woman and her son then are together. And she's actually, I imagined her at work and she's on a break. She's actually on a smoke break. You can't see her other hand, but she's smoking. And she is thinking about then um, her weekend that she spent with her son and that moment that they had together of him playing. And that playing that then becomes a way to then be a symbol of his own hopes and aspirations as well as the aspirations she has for him. Um, and I think then that was really a big turning point for me in thinking about what are those motivations? What are the, what is the hope that can be there instead? And maybe wanting to focus more on the hope than only the, the suffering. Within my practice, I spend a lot of time actually researching um, because in the public school system and state schools, um, at least that I went to, for the most part, they really focus on when you when they focus on the figure, they focus on um, Western European, specifically Greek and Roman and Italian painting and sculpture, um, which are beautiful sculpture, but there is a long history of figuration throughout the entire world. And for this reason, then, I started to think about and wanting to find a way to have iconography to describe then people of Latin American descent. And with that being, you know, to be Latin American often means this mixture of having indigeneity, African, Southern European, and even Asian heritage. And so I started to, you know, reflect upon my own family, what, you know, their heritage and really starting to um, focus in on this figuration throughout Latin America, the headdresses, the types of color palette and materials being used um, as a way to then symbolize um, this kind of trajectory in history. Because it's not that I'm trying to make recreations of the um, pre-Columbian work completely. I'm trying to have them as a um, iconography and a voice to show where people have been where people um, are going and where are they now as well. Because um, it's really trying to be an imagery of people today, of people who find themselves within the United States with these like very distinct cultures that um, they carry with them. Mm -hmm. And so then this piece then is based around uh, the headdress of the mother then, um, or the grandmother I mean, is then a piece of Panamanian gold is what the headdress is based upon. And then, so then that yellow is to symbolize that gold. Um, and then the red being um, in a signifier for cochineal, which is a um, red natural dye um, that then um, is really seen throughout all Latin America and very popular. And then the blue, you know, coming back to that Maya blue as well as then um, indigo is also, um, there's different strains all around the equator, all over the world. And so indigo was used also here in Central America. And so it's a way to kind of connect all those things, but then made with uh, secondhand clothes instead. And so it's like, what materials do the laborers themselves have access to within mm -hmm. their lives? And for me, I, it took me a long time to start working with um, textiles, mainly because I didn't have a background in it. Um, and if anything, I kind of had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder over it. You know, having worn and grown up with a lot of secondhand clothes, it was instead actually kind of a point of, you know, shame, really, of not having nice things, new things, certain brands. Um, and so for a long time, I didn't want those clothes to be the things that defined me. Um, instead, um, you know, I was trying to think about like their, how superficial these things are. But when then coming to learn more and more about this color palette that I'm now um, recreating in a contemporary sense, it's also like a way to then remember like, no, that is part of my experience. And it is part of, and a way to then talk about socioeconomic class. And so it can be used as a tool. I remember it was um, my professor, uh, Malcolm Mobuntu Smith, who I remember in my first um, private critique in grad school, then he was just like, you should make a whole sculpture out of clothes. And it took me a whole year to actually like bring up the courage to actually try it. Um, but once I did, it was like kind of no, no way back because it, it made the most sense and created this um, really 
for me, happy color palette when I'm especially using all these bright colors um, that I can find joy in and think about what people's lives are outside of their jobs as well. When I'm yeah. using a multiple uh, monochromatic, I mean, um, polychromatic color scheme as opposed to a monochromatic color scheme for the workers. Yeah, beautiful. And so I've been um, an artist in residence in Lawrence and having been born in Utah, then lived in Indiana for three years, then um, now living in Kansas for almost th coming on three years. Um, during my time here, then I started to think about, as opposed to thinking about the laborers in more of a broad sense of like the different big four sectors that Latino Americans have um, been working in, then I started to want to focus in something more specific um, and learn and spend time learning about then the local um, history here of Latin Americans. And the history here in Lawrence is that um, the Santa Fe Railroad hired Mexican laborers and their families then brought, um, came with them and lived um, in the Santa Fe Railroad um, apartments, La Yarda was what they, the residents themselves called it. Um, and they worked on for the railroad and maintained the lines. Um, and part of why they did this is because when they hired solely uh, individual um, workers, they were more likely to run in that they were gonna just up and leave their job because the reality was is the job was dangerous. It wasn't well paid. And when they brought in a family as opposed to an individual, they were more likely to stay just because it was too hard for them to move their whole family yet again. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the former residents, um, there's about, I think five left now. Um, cause this was back in the third, between the thirties and 50, 1950. Uh, one is then there was a, a flood that then destroyed the apartments. And so then the former residents now are like, um, doing, uh, oral histories and working with, then um, documentarians to create um, uh, videos uh, all about what life was like in La Yarda, where they talk about their experiences, the food they ate, um, the things that they used to do at, in activities, the schools, um, and some of the racism that they had to face that they didn't really kind of um, focus too much on at the time, but kind of reflecting back then, like, yeah, the, you know, some of the things they experienced. And the oral histories that I listened to are then through the Watkins Museum here in town. And a number of the residents then, um, when they're in their oral histories, described the gardens that they grew. They had a plot, multiple plots usually, that then they grew both for flowers as well as then for fr fresh produce. And that was something that was like kind of like a through line between them all. And I find that um, captivating because, you know, it takes. There's this like um, word, the uh, ganas, in that is like what you are able to do um, despite the situation. So through like even like hard means, no matter what, you'll find a way, kind of a thing. Um, doesn't have like yes. a direct translation, but um, like guts, right? You gotta have guts. Yeah, yeah. And so then it was like, um, you know, they despite the fact that they you know weren't paid that well. Um, you know, then they had these gardens and they made sure that they were ate, ate well. Yeah. And as well as then have then the flowers themselves just to, you know, have some beauty also in their lives. And so they really all actually were fairly positive about their experiences in these oral histories. But then that was like a way for me to then kind of connect with it. And then I mean, creating the Seeds of Tomorrow sculpture, Semillas del Mañana, then is a way to then, um, I took molds directly off certain produce that they mentioned in those oral histories and then recreate them in ceramic. Um, I think I'm gonna, I'm just gonna ask you to hold that thought for a second. I think we're gonna switch to Victoria who will oh. tell her story and then we'll come back and talk about the specific things that are in the show. Does that sound good? Sound good. Okay, great. Good. It was good to, to get to that point to understand. And then we, and everybody remember fabric, clothing, everything that's happening. So then we can connect it when we talk about them together. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. And sorry, I had something, there was something funny about the way I was sharing the screen. In, in here, it looked normal, but evidently out in Zoom land, it was looking weird, so. Um,
All right, Victoria, give us your background and then we will talk about your two pieces that are in the show, everybody together. Okay, go ahead, Victoria. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I- um... Oh, did you send me something else? Yeah, I sent you an uh, updated okay. presentation with older photos, but we can we can go and look with different at different photos. Okay, actually, if you give me two seconds, I should probably. Oop. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Maybe it's a. a um an update from the same powerpoint i don't think i have it do you have it on your computer you want to share your screen yes i can do that all right sorry everyone sorry about that but yeah you should be able to share your screen now Now, if I had said this before, I could have been looking for it while John was talking. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's see. All right, let me share my screen. Aha. Do you want to see this? Yep, perfect. All right, great. Um, you could just let me know when you want me to move on to the next slide too. Um, so this was one of my first sculptural works in ceramic, really trying to figure out my, my own methodology, my own interpretation of the figure, what I was trying to say. Um, a lot of my earlier work was focused on um, really confronting the, the unseen emotional states, particularly of the Black community. Um, as I came into my own ceramic practice, a lot of my own work was stemming from my questions around some of the things that I was dealing with as I was um, undergoing um, transitions in, in my health status um, as I was dealing with disability, as I was dealing with um, other various emotional things. And I realized just um, the weight that that Black people hold, not in the complexity of, of our identities as we are in this country, um, in a system of oppression, in a system of constriction, restriction, um, while also holding the, the beautiful experiences of our culture and our traditions that we hold together and the legacies of our families, um, while also carrying the personal things, the hidden things, the things that um, happen to us on an individual level that are are not necessarily um, communal in that sense. And so I was looking at it from so many different levels and figuring out like, um, how can I make work that speaks not only to what I'm experiencing in this moment, that, but that um, can speak to how other Black people might feel as they're navigating these things too. And so this work was called The Covering and, um, I was playing around with the, the historic use of using black as a skin tone. And, and um, although there are, there are negative connotations to this use as well, a lot of black artists in this country and abroad have used it almost as um, um, a collective a symbol as well. Um, something that is uniting across uh across across country creed and various things that links us to our our essential heritage and so i was playing around with this and thinking about 
a hedge of, a hedge of protection thinking about in spiritual lens of having something that would point outward and that would also cradle the figure and so although I'm talking about trauma and I'm talking about painful things I also wanted there to be a sense of nurturing a sense of um, some sense of comfort. And so I think this is one of those pieces that successfully um, has an element of trauma while also touching on um, these, these aspects of healing as well. And so later in my work, I started to expand into other abstractions of the figure. And so I used... Um, um my own face as a reference in a small series where I was talking about how trauma um can ultimately in some situations fragment our 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 psyche from who we perceived ourselves to be in the past and who we are now and so the distance from um who we were before before incident and um, the lasting ramifications of that. And so these are works where I'm really asking these difficult questions and I'm, I'm really asking the viewer to get personal with me. <laughs> and, um, and, and this was an exciting moment in, in my work because I, I, for the first time was asking an audience to go there um to be like what is your trauma um how is how is um do you feel fragmented within your emotional state do you feel fragmented within your psyche and and um and see if this resonated with people i was genuinely asking at this moment like does this does this resonate to you and unfortunately i I um, got a lot of really positive feedback that people um, got what I was saying. Uh, this work, I am not in control, was really about a time of my life where um, I was reflecting on the nature of some things happen to us that we cannot explain, and sometimes there is not a good reason for it. And so um, grappling with those emotions um, and particularly, I was reflecting on um, from a societal lens, being a black woman um, and being in multiple situations where we have a lack of control towards and then also processing in our own in our own personal lives, navigating instances where we don't have control and what that can feel like. And sometimes it feels like um it feels like we do not always know what's going to pour out of us, right? Um, and and sometimes we can be surprised by our our emotional response, and sometimes we can be upset by our emotional response. And so this was a piece where I was very vulnerable within my own journey, and and also putting that information out there, and 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 I I. This was the beginning of using my work also for advocacy being like, this is normal and this happens. <laughs> and really trying to destigmatize mental health, particularly for Black people, and destigmatizing um, how much we carry and just being like, Let's let's talk about it. Let's admit that it's going on. And so um, these works are vital to my practice moving forward. Um, and then I really challenged scale. I when I came to grad school at Alfred University, um, due to the to to the facilities and the fact that you can almost make anything here. And coupled with, I was really searching for a greater impact between the physical work and the viewer. I wanted there to be a stronger relationship to someone saying, well, 
this is life size. And so I'm really connecting it to my body. I'm really connecting it to this like lived experience. And so this, these were several works within my first year where they were life size. And I was also still talking about these themes of um, mental health and, and navigating societal outside pressures and internal ones. Um, something that's really important in my work is, is honoring the beauty of Black identity, the beauty of Black people, and never um, my use of trauma in my work is not a reflection of how I feel about being Black. It's never a reflection of that. It's more so a reflection of what we have to go through. Um, and so there is an element of grace, or at least an element of how I rendered the body that um, I hope comes off as honoring or comes off as referential. And so um, that that is something that I've been maintaining in my practice. And so these are these are earlier works where um, I think I was more expansive about what trauma was um, a, a counter to what I'm doing right now. So kind of over the last few months, um, I realized I wanted to be more vocal about disability and more vocal about the intersections of disability, queerness, and, and, and being Black. And so um, I started to pull from influences in my childhood of um, having a brother who has a disability. And then also my own coming to as someone who um, now has a health disability. And so really thinking about the constriction from society on these types of bodies, on these types of identities and how um, there's this stigma around nonconformity. And so right now my work is truly about advocating for nonconformity as being natural, as being something that has always existed. Um, and so there is an urgency in the work right now and there's a directness in the work which might not have been there when I first came to grad school. And so this work that is in the Figuring Space show right now, which is by Sigma, what I am and am not, is directly speaking about those experiences um, of stigma, of how it can feel to be at the intersection of those identities. Um, and so the Black on the body is not a reflection of Black identity, it is a reflection of the stigma. And so, um, just being really intentional between the use of material, the proximity to the body and the scale of the body, because I want people to really think about their own experiences um, that they're having within their own lives. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and, and you definitely feel, you know, you stand in front of it and you feel that you're communicating pain. Yeah. Um, so I want to show your work side by side and then ask some questions. And I know we're, unfortunately, we're not, we don't have a lot of time left and I want people to be able to ask questions too. Um, but it's really exciting to be able to see. All right. I'm just going to keep talking while I do this. I can do it. Um, Jonathan, I've been wondering, people always ask me, and then I forget to ask you, why are their fingers white? Do you have a reason? Yeah. Every time um, I give a tour and I'm like, um, I forgot to ask him again. <laughs> it's to create a focal point and drawing attention to the hands doing the, the labor themselves. And so whatever role it is, whether job it is, you know, like picking something up, holding on to something, um, it's to draw a focal point to that. And that glaze that I'm using uh, is, uh, you know, based around Mayolica, which is a, you know, was traditionally a tin glaze that first came from Islamic tile traditions to then Spain um, through, um, and then from Spain to then to also to like Mexico and Talavera pottery 
And so it's like a way to then connect that specific glaze and that history of that to then the peoples who, who it is on now. Mm, that's great. Um, do you two want to ask each other any questions about your use of fabric? I would love to hear your, um, oh, why don't I have a picture of the fabric? Okay. Sorry. I definitely ask the question. I'll just use I'd this be one. curious because like, um, will the fabric continue to be creating environments for the figures or will the fabric ever find their way onto the, the figures themselves? They will always be environment. Um, yeah, I, I kind of work in a monochromatic um, palette for the most part, except for like accent areas. Um, and the, in the background, the environment is where I get to kind of open up to all these different colors. And so um, I do like a separation between the figure and what's surrounding it. Um, yeah, that's just where I'm at personally with it. I would love to know how you construct all the ties. So are they are they all sewn together or are they all um kind of layered um they so it starts off by almost like working if you were to work solid on an armature in like large sections of clay mm -hmm. so then i'm adding large kind of pillow like forms made out of secondhand clothes um onto the bodies and i'm creating then the general kind of mass of the, the figures bodies themselves mm -hmm. but then you know they it's the uh, you know looks kind of looks like a uh, upholstery or something like that instead um and so then from there i'm then cutting the <laughs> fabric into strips to then um then i'm tying that on and using pretty much like a square knot or what I'm, i was also told as a weaver's knot to then just connect from one piece to the next and then binding around over and over and over and over so like as an example on that um the adult figure the mother in that then she, you know, uses like, I don't know, 60 pairs of jeans or so. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm using that, I'm thinking about then the actual, like how something that is, can be physically superficial, clothes themselves, says a lot about what the person's role is, their job is, what resources, resources they have access to. But then, you know, like you can take off a shirt, put on a different shirt and be a completely different person depending on like that like how you look to present to the world and how you identify um but then by using it in this way then i'm thinking about how something that is physically superficial becomes the body itself and becomes like and i think about that as the the muscles of the body of the labor mm -hmm. of the person and how then that tension that then and that binding is both strength but also like kind of like the body having to sustain the the labors themselves mm -hmm. um it's kind of both things both strength as well as like the effects of of labor wow. that's interesting that i didn't even think about that could be like upholstery stuffing as the other clothes i imagined that it was all wrapping but it makes a lot more sense yeah so <laughs> it starts off with those larger volumes and they it's some using uh green fiber so that's what they use to insulate houses um, it's just like a uh, cellulose pretty much um, that then is ground into a pulp. And then, so it's like always trying to use also like materials that people would use in their everyday jobs uh, within the, whether it's construction or the service or agriculture or um, a factory. And then the headdresses are the same pulp, then you've colored it or is that what that is? Yeah, so that then um, I cut then the, the clothes into smaller pieces. Um, and then run them through a blender to turn them into pulp. And then I also um, combine that with paper pulp, so of the similar color. Um, and then from there, they're laid over a metal armature. And the I use a binder, a archival um, PVA glue, which is acid-free. It's what book binders use. Um, and then that then is like the, the binder then that hardens and makes them very rigid over that armature so it can become quite strong um but it's just like having multiple textures of like this material because it's like oh with whatever kind of material you use you're transforming it 
And so it's like, how far do you transform this material, whether it be clay or fibers or wood, and then pushing it further and further along so that then, you know, it's still legible that it's, you know, from the strips, it's more legible that it's clothes. And then mm -hmm. the headdresses, then it gets like, you can still see the texture of the clothes themselves, but then it's even pushed even further because, you know, still like as a way to then make and be iconography from um, our indigenous ancestry as Latin Americans. I love the way like you, you said tension. You've said that a couple of times and that the that tying um, and the, the fact that the figures are bound is, you know, expressing this idea of tension and they're sort of bound to their labor and the necessity to be working um, these difficult jobs. And then this, that Victoria's use of fabric and you can kind of see it in this photo, it's more ephemeral almost sort of draped. Um, it's certainly not giving you a feeling of comfort necessarily, <laughs> but it's a very different approach to like physically seeing the tension. And then, um, so maybe Victoria, you can talk a little bit about the asymmetry, the choice to use these very asymmetrical form and then how you've altered um, the fabric to create this like cellular pattern, um, which is something that I, I see, I don't know if that's intentional. Um, I am really attracted to asymmetry <laughs> just in general. Um, it, even just in the placement of the hands, I didn't want them to, to match. Um, but the, the, the tapestry in a sense is taking up the space that the upper body would. And so I wanted to have this connection to something that is there but is almost intangible and so this 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 mesh fabric is extending upward kind of it continuing the spine um so i wanted your eye to keep going up um with the tapestry the this fabric choice is really for the it's a it's silk brocade um i haven't necessarily i didn't create this fabric i'm just using it um but i'm using it in a variety of different palettes i have um, a green one that i use a lot when i'm referencing nature and so it's just particularly when you see those two um, in contrast to each other, I think it really helps to speak towards kind of lightness and and lightness and then trauma. Um, but particularly in this one, it felt it felt like cells. It felt it felt almost like a blood stain. Um, I thought it was just really interesting to speak to the quality of pain that was in the hands as well. So I was really thinking about surface as a related between the tapestry and the ceramic. Yeah, the blood cell, that's that's what I kind of think about those forms in the background, like swimming around. Um, I feel like we could talk for another hour, but we um, have asked people only to join us until two. So it's a little bit over. I guess I'll just Say again, if we look at these two sculptures that are addressing such important issues, they look nothing alike. But then when you um, put artists in conversation and think about the connection between the hands, you both emphasize hands in different way, the use of fabric um, and the use of drawing attention to something that's really important in our society. So thank you both for making this powerful artwork and being part of Figuring Space. Thank you so much for um, inviting us and to um, thank you everyone for your attention today and um, coming with us on this journey. And uh, thank you also for uh, inviting us to be part of this wonderful show, Jennifer. Yes, it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and to everyone that came to hear us today. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, thanks. This recording will be online. Yeah. Where's that one? <laughs> The recording will be online probably next week, and um, we look forward to anyone who's in the area coming to see the exhibition in real life. Feel free to reach out for a tour, and we'll see you all soon.
Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Guys.